So uh, we've made some changes that are gonna, gonna give you some more tools. I'm gonna ask uh, these two fine legal officers that we have, these are two of the finest legal minds in the nation. Um, and before they get up or while they're coming up here, I do wanna tell you that they're gonna talk about some changes we've made to some Idaho codes with the state legislature this year. It was a huge change. When we first started this, everybody downtown said, you'll never get this done in one year. It's impossible. It'll take you two or three years. These guys, along with, with DT, have, have really worked with every group imaginable. And uh, it's passed both the House and Senate waiting for the governor to sign. So. Good morning, Major General Sailors. Thank you for letting us take a few minutes to discuss something we're very excited about and that is uh, House Bill 53, otherwise known as the new and improved Idaho Code of Military Justice. Um, anyone who's ever been a commander or in leadership knows that our, our Code of Military Justice has been on the books for 40 years, but has been somewhat ineffective and antiquated. Uh, we changed that this year, and we have adopted the Model Code, uh, Idaho Code of Military Justice. Uh, we started last summer in drafting and uh, met with about every uh, state and local agency to socialize this, get people aware of what we're doing, and finally introduced it into the House, which it passed, and, and it just passed the Senate on Thursday. Um, and so we're going to talk just a, a few minutes on some highlights and what the new ICMJ does and how it improves our military justice system as a whole. All right, for those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Captain Steve Stokes. I'm another full-time attorney here with the Idaho National Guard. <clears throat> As you know, there are two types of uh, codes of military justice. There is the Uniform Code of Military Justice, and there are State Codes of Military Justice. The Uniform Code of Military Justice, I'm sure you've had a million briefs on that. You understand where that comes from. It's a body of federal law, um, and it deals with civilian and military offenses. State Codes of Military Justice, the, the, the problem is, is that there are 54 states and territories that each have their own individual code of military justice. And those codes of military justice apply to the soldiers and airmen in those particular states and territories. Because they're not uniform, uh, and they're all old, most of them were enacted in the mid to late 70s, early 80s, they just don't reflect the current tone of the National Guard, uh, the operational force that we have right now. So in 2003, 2004, um, Congress asked the National Guard Bureau to draft the model code of, of uh, state model code of military justice. Uh, it was drafted. It was vetted through um, uh, Air JAGs, uh, Army JAGs, um, through the American Bar Association, uh, and various groups have been trying to get this adopted in uh, in states around the nation. Primarily, it enhances the governor's control as commander in chief. Um, it provides for consistent application of military justice, uh, especially when we're dealing with uh, multi-state forces like we have in the 116th. We've got forces from Oregon and Montana, and when they come down here to train with us, we have to apply their law. Uh, and it makes it very awkward and cumbersome when somebody does something uh, and there's inconsistent application. Uh, and in addition, it focuses almost exclusively on military offenses uh, versus the Uniform Code of Military Justice that does you know, the civilian type stuff, rape, murder, theft, assault, battery, uh, and the military offenses like AWOL, uh, after without leave, uh, disrespect, that kind of thing. Sorry if this is awkward. We've just been briefing this on a tag team basis and we just don't know how to do it any other way. <laughs> so key provisions. This is what you need to take away. And of course, we'll, we'll follow this up with more command briefs and training on, on how to utilize this. But the, the number one thing is it follows the UCMJ formatting and numbering. So if you look at the UCMJ, if you look at the new ICMJ, the offenses, the numbered offenses are going to be the same. And for the most part, it's going to be consistent with the UCMJ. The big one, um, our current code only, only allows us to apply the uh, use ICMJ when you're in a duty status, and that's always been an issue because a lot of stuff happens when you're not in a duty status that a commander wants to take um, deal with. So the new code talks about 24-7 jurisdiction and obviously military offenses, but also even if they're non-military offenses and it occurs off-duty, if there's a military nexus between the misconduct and the organization, commander can still assert uh, jurisdiction over that soldier or airman, and that's a huge change. Uh, 
uh, clarifies court martial convening authorities and allows us for the first time to convene summary court martials, which we've never had the ability to do. Um, clarifies other things, statute of limitations, and makes punishments consistent with the UCMJ. So if you're gonna give someone an Article 15, the punishments under the new code of military justice for Idaho will be consistent with UCMJ punishments for MJP. Um, and also, lastly, it confirms and clarifies that a soldier and airman does have a right to due process and does have a right to defense counsel, which our current code did not do. So why does this matter to you? Um, you're all here because you're leaders and commanders. The, the first thing that you should take away is it will allow you to use uh, Article 15, non-judicial punishment, a lot more frequently. And the reason why we haven't done it in the past, like Major Boyce said, is because we haven't had the ability to convene summary courts martial. So if a commander wanted to do an Article 15 on a soldier or an airman who had done something wrong and they turned it down and demanded a trial, we would have to ask the governor, or excuse me, ask the TAG to ask the governor to ask the Supreme Court to appoint a judge to hear this case. And that would never happen for something like absent without leave or missing movement or something of that nature. But now we have the ability to convene a summary court martial at the battalion, squadron, or group level. And that's important because we can, have, um, we can have a soldier who turns it down, they demand their trial, it's presided over by a field grade officer, it's done in the drill weekend, and you're, you've moved on to the next thing. In addition, like Major Boyce said, it allows for punitive action for things that happen in a non-drill status. And I don't know about you guys, but I see this all the time. Somebody does something downtown, a fraternization case, something like that, and, and we can't do anything about it. The worst we can do is a letter of reprimand um, or an administrative reduction or administrative separation, which is a huge loss of training value uh, for the soldier. Okay, so that's the ICMJ. The last thing that the tag, Major General Saylor wanted me to talk about, or us to talk about, was a significant policy memorandum that's been in effect since October of last year and that is the prohibition uh, against personally owned weapons um, on IDNG property. Everyone should be familiar with this, um, but again, we're reiterating it today. Um, you can read the slide for yourself there. The, the, the bottom line takeaway is possession of personally owned weapons on Gowan Field or any facility owned or leased by the IDNG is expressly prohibited. There are exceptions to that that are in the policy. Um, and if anyone wants to be granted an exception to policy, they have to submit that request directly to the TAG, who will grant that exception to policy. Temporary storage. If somebody has to or does not, not aware of this policy or has to carry a personally owned weapon, there is a process by which that weapon can be stored on Gallon Field, and there's implement, implementing procedures for that in the policy. And lastly, IDNG 42 is punitive, meaning a violation of it can subject you to disciplinary or administrative adverse action. And that's all we have. With that, we'll turn it back over to Major General Sailor.